Fallow for the freezer. Kai App Bryn is out after meat. Sometimes things work out, sometimes things don't. Hunting heart beast with loo paper. The Northern Cape Professional Hunting School shows how to track big game. You know how to stop it. This is a good one. Awesome. Yeah. Formula One boss Ross Braun explains how to make clay shooting great. Meredith has the news on the news stump and James Martington has the best hunting and shooting videos in hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Some mornings are made for stalking. Absolutely beautiful. Sometimes that's what it's all about. We are pre-fallow rut and it's Kai's first opportunity to head out onto his permission to fill his depleted freezers with venison. It's been a hectic summer. High demand for venison means he needs to head out for some wild shopping. So this was plan A. And now we're going to go back to plan B. We might even have an air forage, I don't know. So. <laughs> this morning we are struggling with an untypical wind direction. I think because they've cut across there, if any other deer were behind that hill, they'd have, the deer and other deer would have followed. So we're just going to go straight back to the truck, go to the side of the farm and try and work on those other ones that uh, we saw this first thing this morning. So I think that's the best bet. There are plenty of deer, including the high-vis jacket wearing white ones. Plan B works and Kai spots a single buck. Helpfully, there is convenient cover between us and it. It's more than 200 yards away. It's on the edge of a wood and Kai knows there's dirt behind it. I'm going to try and take him over this hedge. <laughs> sometimes things work out, sometimes things don't, but there's a deer on the deck, so we're going to go and see, see it now, but I think there's um, probably just slightly high on my behalf. Um, he's dropped, so we'll go and have a look now. As we approach, Kai explains his balancing act of keeping the deer numbers at a level where the farmers are happy, taking the meat he needs, and not pushing the deer so hard they go nocturnal. If you were estimating for next year then, how many deer would be ideal for you to bag over the next few months? I would say up until February, March. I'd like to be in the region of like 70 to 80 deer. Some farms work better earlier on in the year, some farms work better later on in the year, some farms have got more does. There's a lot to it, it's not just there's a deer in the field going to shoot it. So when I go out tomorrow, the next day, I'll go to another farm, I'll give this one a, a week or two, come back to it. That's how it works. You know, that's, that's how we do it anyway. So everything, everyone, everyone's different, everyone's got their own ways, but I think that's, for us, that's the best way. You can just see, just pinch the top there. Two or three inches higher than I want it to be, but the deer's down. I still make exceptionally good eating. <laughs> this bit always makes me wince. <laughs> As he grallocks the buck, it's heartening to hear about the popularity of venison. The issue must be its availability to the general public. The good tester for me is when we do festivals because that's the public. So at Long Road Festival, we went through 280 kilos of venison haunch, boneless. It's a good news story for, for game for venison, especially at such a public event. That's not like a game fair or anything like that. As this is all about the meat, Kai talks through the cuts he will take from this fallow buck. Take out the back straps whole and we'll trim them. So take the silver skin off them, backpack them down. And then the haunches, we will um, just debone them, butterfly them and backpack them whole, put rub on there, put them on the grill. That'd be really good. And then everything else will be minced for our kind of venison slider burgers, meatballs, sausage rolls that we do for weddings and events. 
Shoulders we will leave whole if we can. Slow cook these down or smoke them so they pull apart. So we do like pulled pork, but pulled venison shoulder. The neck will be minced as well. So yeah, so right. all the animal gets used basically. <laughs> We're starting to think about our own breakfast. David asks Kai to check out what our buck has been feasting on. So there's acorns, look. You saw it scraping. Look. Just as we expected, it's a protein-rich diet of acorns. It'd be good for your compost, wouldn't it? For more information about the Bergara range of rifles, head to artemisoutdoorsuk.co.uk. Thanks, Kai. Now, we gave away 10 pellet pods this week. Next week's prize draw is for two tickets priced at £115 each for top game chef Jose Souto's game seminar in a London cookery theatre. This is the 15th year Jose has done this seminar. Date is the 8th of November 2023, starting at 10 a.m. and finishing at 4 p.m. and including a three course game lunch. You can also buy tickets by following the link below. Easiest way to win them is to watch this week's Field Sports Extra, our exclusive show for Field Sports Nation members. Join the Field Sports Nation and we'll send you a goodie box. What we get out of it is cash to produce our news content and to fight Chris Packham in court. And more on that if you watch Field Sports Extra too. Next, everything David is not, including better hair. It's Meredith on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. You are watching Field Sports Channel News. Basque has issued a plea to its members to take part in a consultation on the use of lead in ammunition. The new Consultation Health and Safety Executive lasts until the 10th of December 2023. It proposes changes to the way ammunition is made, sold and used. Following a consultation last year, the government has withdrawn plans to stop the phase-out of lead in air gun pellets. The government still wants to reduce or remove lead and plastic in other areas of shooting. Here at Basque, we're encouraging everybody to get involved where they can and supply further evidence. The consultation closes on the 10th of December, so please get involved and head over to the Basque website for further information. Aim to Sustain will now run Game Assurance in the UK. The Aim to Sustain umbrella group for organisations with an interest in UK game shooting is to take over British Game Assurance's Game Assurance Scheme. Meanwhile, the BGA will rebrand as a game meat marketing body called Eat Wild. It will work alongside Basque's Eat Game marketing body. The Countryside Alliance's Game to Eat marketing body still has a presence on social media, but is not active. Norway's fish farmers have been told to shoot bluefin tuna that invades seaborne salmon pens. The rise in bluefin numbers is causing issues for Scandinavian salmon farmers. The fish invade pens where salmon are grown for the table. The government has issued guidance on how to deal with the tuna, which can weigh in excess of 300 kilos. It says the directorate recommends that euthanasia be carried out with firearms. Shots must be aimed at the fish's brain so it loses consciousness immediately. Scottish farmers have written to the government to ask for help in protecting their stocks from sea eagles. The birds are thriving since their reintroduction to the Scottish countryside in 1973. They're now causing issues for sheep farmers with an estimated 175 breeding pairs. Some are predating on livestock. The Scottish sheep industry says severe predation of their flocks is increasingly difficult to manage and control. A local council has struck a blow for the countryside by turning its back on veganism. Suffolk Council is expected to vote formally to support local farmers and food producers this week, bucking a trend to force local authorities to eat only plant-based food at their functions. The proposal says the council will ensure it always provides locally sourced meat and dairy options alongside plant-based options at its catered events. It is the third local authority to adopt countryside-friendly policies in recent months, following the lead of councillors in Cornwall and North Northamptonshire. And we hope that regardless of political party, every councillor gets behind this important motion and says yes to our countryside. Scientists that refuse to undertake basic gamekeeping have found a new scapegoat for their failures with capercaillies. Scientists from Forestry and Land Scotland say that the abundance of voles on land where the capercaillie roam is key to the welfare of the birds. If voles are present in numbers, predators eat them. If not, the rare grouse may become their target. 
Scientists say they are now surveying 60,000 acres of vole habitat in the Cairngorms to inform their research. Meanwhile, they remain ideologically opposed to controlling those predators, meaning the bird species is heading for extinction. A new coin collection highlights the plight of Britain's endangered creatures. The Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust this week praised the use of fish and animals that are central to their conservation work in the new Royal Coin Collection. The new pound coin features bees, the 50p shows an Atlantic salmon and the 10p coin has a capercaillie. The Atlantic salmon represents the GWCT's research project on the River Frome, which has monitored salmon migration there for the past 40 years. Louisiana's hunters may get back their black bear tickets. The Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries announces it will hold a vote in November to consider whether a limited hunting season for black bears could be reintroduced. It follows extensive work from Safari Club International to prevent bears from being delisted as a licensed hunting quarry. There are around 1,200 of them living in the state. And finally, scientists from the Natural History Museum are laying traps to capture invasive mitten crabs for the first time. There are thought to be millions of the creatures inhabiting Britain's waterways and they're considered to be one of the most serious non-indigenous invaders in the UK. Experts have now put traps in Pode Harbour in Lincolnshire. They've also asked the public to be vigilant and to report sightings so they can monitor the spread of the crabs. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, Meredith, who asks if you could click like or subscribe below this film. Next, we're off to South Africa, where I went last year after Heart of Beast. First, you put a bullet into a target to show that you can. Then the students from the Northern Cape Professional Hunting School use the skills they have learned to give you the hunt of a lifetime. Today we are after Plains Game on the school's ranch in the Northern Cape of South Africa. There we go, that's a good size. Yeah, okay, that'll work you. it. All right, cool. Uh, I've been here for five months, I think, four to five months. So and how long have you got to go? Uh, it's a seven month course, so three months more to go. This piece of land is 6,000 hectares. There's a big mountain that's 2,000 2, hectares big, and the area we'll be hunting is about 1,000 hectares big um, in our area right now. We're going to be stalking anything big, any trophy animals, springbuck, um, blessed buck, red otter beasts, nice water we'll be finding. Um, we've got a nice spot here, we're going to be going um, into the wind, into them, and I believe we're going to find something here in the field, so uh, I believe we'll be successful today. Now you're good on, you're good on wildlife, um, you also have to manage a hunter's expectations, don't you? Yes, so, sir. So at this stage of the day, are you honest or dishonest? I'm always honest. I gotta, um, the weather is looking good. I'm not lying about that. It's The animals are everywhere. Uh, I believe we're going to be successful. Duan and his friends are out in teams with clients, me and Ollie Williams, and they already know that I am in a good area. It's been raining a little and the outlook is unsettled. Animals are on the move wherever we look, pushed either by us or by the change in the weather. One group is sitting still and that's the one the guides decide to go for. There's a dry river bed just behind this mountain that we're going to walk on until we are in range and then see if we can take a shot. Dry riverbeds make the easiest cover. When we get into position, the wary hearty beasts seem to know we are coming. We pause and regroup. We just switched hunters and now we're going to go stalk some wildebeest right now. Some blue wildebeest. They're going to be out over here. Um, this is where they normally stay, so we're going to go stalk them right now. We bump animal after animal and don't get close to the wildebeest. It doesn't help having a lanky Englishman in the group. At last, we come across animals near the water's edge. They're on the side of the massive Vanderkloof Dam. Rhys finds another dry riverbed. The animal stands. But not good enough. Don't try to shoot an African animal that's facing you, is the lesson. 
The animal is no longer with the main group, which is running for the far range of hills. It will need tracking. First step is to establish the blood trail. The students take a methodical approach to this, marking every drop of blood with white loo paper, which makes a clear trail across the scrub and establishes a direction of travel. For me, it's that sickening moment you hope never happens between shooting the game and finding the game and you want it to be as quick as possible. Of course, Africa doesn't care. Wildlife conducts its business around you as usual, but you do. And of course, you wonder why you took the shot. Second step is to call in the professionals, head of the Northern Cape Professional Hunting School, Meinhard Hierhold, and his Dachshunds. We follow the trail long into the afternoon. It's heading towards a small hill which marks the end of our beat. Beyond it, Ollie is hunting with another group of guides. As the sun goes down, we realise there's nothing we can do. When we get back to camp, there's good news. Ollie was walking into a herd of wildebeest when his guide saw a lone hartebeest. They diverted, Ollie shot it, and they brought it in. My hartebeest. Ollie will, of course, never let me hear the end of it. For our next outing on Hartebeest, the sun is out and Meinhardt asks the students to organise something different. So this is a, a game movement day, or even you might call it a driven game uh, day. We're heading up uh, a little, little goyle, we call it in Devon, a little valley here. And uh, we're going to sit about halfway up this 500 foot scarp that's in front of us. Uh, and uh, some of the students from the school are up on top and they are bringing the top slowly down towards us. From under a tree we are out of sight and wait for the game to head our way. Are you happy for me to shoot it while it's walking? happens as Cooney describes, but it's still a surprise. A kudu walks right behind our tree. So a bull came out, bull, kudu, to begin with, with the sun right behind it. We didn't know what it was. And I set up, Cooney got me ready, and he said, okay, wait, let's see what it is, let's see what it's gonna do. Meanwhile, my heart is really, really racing. Hands, arms shaking, legs shaking. Gotta stay calm. And then Cooney says, okay, it's a it's a good bull, but it's going to be a really good bull one day. So we let it go. We let it go. It's just a kind of fabulous wildlife encounter you only get in hunting. That's it for the morning drive, so it's back down the hill and off to our afternoon position. Along the way, we meet up with another hunting party out today, which has had a good water buck. Meinhardt puts us into the right place with advice for Cooney. OK, if I come and they don't stop, then you must stop him. You, you know how to stop it. This is it on last one? Yeah. Okay. 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 But you must sit down here, okay. sit in front of him, and more than likely we're going to come Straight. on that path or just Straight on down. the horizon or under. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, my lad. Safety first. Cooney checks the rifle. Just like then we run through the raspberry drill. <laughs> What's that noise mean? Animals come alert but unstressed over the hill. This one we want does exactly what we want, and it doesn't even require a raspberry to stop it. It drops where I shoot it. After the drive is over, Cooney and I go up the hill to find it. Soon the rest of the team come to retrieve it. So, contrary to what you might 
have seen in the newspapers, the trophy photograph is really important, especially to these guys. And so they're behind me chatting about how to set it up, how to get the best light. I mean, it's like being in a, a photography studio in London. But for me, the really important part, and, and I think for the, the estate management, the really important part is this is an old bull. He's past breeding. He's way, way past his best. He's an absolutely lovely animal to take out of the herd. And I am just so happy. It is, it's a really, really, I'm very pleased. You can go to the Northern Cape Professional Hunting School as a student. You can also go, like me, as a client with the students guiding you. It is a wonderful setup. You will enjoy it. Link in the description below. Thanks all from the Northern Cape Professional Hunting School who works on that, especially Kayla van Furen for filming most of it. And if you fancy spending several months in the bush learning to wrangle big game, there's a link to the school below. Next, from big game in Africa to clay shooting. Did you know that clay shooting was one of the biggest spectator sports of the late 19th century? Our podcast this week is a chat in the Cartagena's Game Fair Theatre in July with Ross Braun, managing director of one of today's biggest spectator sports, Formula One, and a keen shooter. We talk about how to re-establish clay shooting to international greatness. Um, petrol heads, mm, we got gum nuts, that wouldn't really work, <laughs> would it? <laughs> well, I think... I think you've got to look at, you, first of all, you've got to have the integrity of the competition. You must never compromise that. But can the competition be tuned in some way to make it more engaging? So there's a question of what should the competition be? And then how can you show different perspectives on that that fans can engage with? I mean, one of the big things that we did in Formula One was to put cameras inside the cars. So you can follow a driver as he's driving the car from inside the car. You can even get, we've got a camera now, it goes inside the helmet next to his eye. So you see exactly what he's seeing in the car. And then we have cameras all around the cars so they can get the perspective of what's going on around it. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, a little long, that never existed. You just saw the cars from outside. You didn't feel part of it. And therefore, is there camera technology? Is there content that can be captured with shooting? Uh, I mean, I'm always fascinated when I see camera guns and you can see the shot and the dispersal of the shot and where you are with the shot. And, uh, but is there technology that shooting could engage with which would enhance the presentation of the competition without spoiling the competition? Thanks, Ross. And thanks to the British Shooting Show for supporting our podcasts. Link to the full episode below. Now from motor racing to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, brought to you by James Marchington, it's Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube with James to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. First this week, here's the heartwarming story of a father and son. American air gunner Rossi's dad took him hunting as a boy. 33 years later, he returns the favor, taking his father out after a big buck with a large caliber air gun. Here's another deer hunting tale from the States. Patrick Hoover shoots a buck with bow and arrow, but it's a race to recover it before the bears get there. He shoots one bear, but by the time he reaches the deer, there's nothing left. Back to the UK and the cigar smoking hunter is stalking red stags in the rut on the Isle of Arran. It's wet, cold and windy and his scope camera packs up, but he gets a beast in the end. Further south, in less demanding conditions, Rob Speed is walking up partridges with a lovely 100-year-old English side-by-side. -side. Once he's got used to how the gun shoots, he achieves a special right and left, but sadly forgets to press the record button for that one. More partridge shooting. This one from the Strictly Shooting Channel is a special young short stay in glorious North Wales countryside, hosted by Ellis Speed. Sporting. Here's a film of a driven game day from the side we don't often see on YouTube. This one follows the beaters, who seem to be having at least as much fun as the guns. Meanwhile, Stuart from Vermin Control Scotland is dealing with a big infestation of feral pigeons on a farm. He's using an air rifle and night vision scope in the dark for fast, efficient shooting and ends up with a bag close to 100. Finally, here's someone you might recognise going by the pseudonym of Tucker243. He's having a great day on the pigeons, a total of 239 decoyed over barley and shot with a Benelli semi-auto. That's it for this week. We've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email Charlie the link, charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week. If you haven't done so, please whiz over to our website, 
fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click the like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about this show. Field Sports Britain is at 7pm UK time every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing and goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>